Welcome, everybody. I'm Howard Chansky, Chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and welcome to our June uh, edition of Grand Rounds. A couple of announcements uh, before we get started. Uh, first of all, welcome to our incoming uh, interns. Our R1 class has arrived. Um, I don't see many of them on the, on the list yet, but hopefully they'll be uh, joining us. It's going to be a great group. I think five years from now, we're going to uh, realize uh, what a fantastic group of residents uh, we just um, hired. And a couple of um, kudos, which is one of our Grand Rounds uh, traditions. Um, hopefully, uh, Dr. Dillon is listening. Um, Acom received a nice accolade uh, from the Harborview um, ED who said, uh, and this is uh, from John Ilgen, who said uh, Akam was a consummate professional, uh, regularly checking in uh, to communicate plans and help triage consults, all the while providing swift and stellar care to our patients um, while he was juggling uh, many ED and floor consults. Um, and um, Perhaps most importantly, uh, Dr. Dillon was also noted as being unfailingly kind and measured uh, throughout both nights. Um, so, so thank you, Akam. Um, the second um, kudo was from uh, Maya Jones, who's the uh, Associate Director of the Pediatric Residency Program uh, and is an emergency medicine uh, physician at Children's. And uh, she um, had kudos um, for Mario Taylor, the current ortho resident at SCH is excellent. He is extremely efficient and wonderful with families. He also just performed the quickest reduction in cast placement I have seen in the children's ED in the six years I have been there. Uh, so, so thank you for that strong work, uh, Mario. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers for Grand Rounds. And uh, resident is PGY4 Mark Cohn. Um, who is uh, going to be at Scripps Health um, after his residency doing a total joint fellowship. And he partnered with Dr. David Fitz, who is uh, one of our joint surgeons um, at Northwest Hospital. And I'm very excited about this Grand Rounds. They are going to be discussing uh, kinematic versus mechanical alignment in total knee replacements. Um, and this has been a topic that has uh, really come to the fore over the last um, 10 to 15 years. Uh, so thank you. Dr. Cohn. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Cohen. I'm a fourth year orthopedic surgery resident in the department. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chansky, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fitz, for collaborating with me on this project. Thank you, Dr. Turrell, for organizing all these grand rounds throughout the years. And for uh, thank you, Aaron, for everything IT related. So in order to understand kinematic alignment, we have to understand mechanical alignment and where we are today with total joint replacement. These are my disclosures. So today we'll begin with a background on total knee replacement. I'll try to talk about the history of total knee replacement and Insel's legacy in that. I'll talk about Insel's mechanical alignment in total knee replacement. And I'll contrast that with Dr. Hungerford's uh, anatomic alignment. And then we'll ask ourselves, did Insol get it wrong? Are there reasons that we should consider alternatives to mechanical alignment and total knee replacement? So every arthroplasty presentation is obligated to start with this slide, which shows a uh, graph from JBJS in 2007, which is a projection of the number of total knee and total hip replacements that will be performed in the United States from 2005 to 2030. So if we look at where we are here today in 2020, we're at about 1.5 million total knee replacements and just under 500,000 total hip replacements each year in the US. We have an expansion in the number of implants. We have navigation, robotics, patient-specific instrumentation, cemented versus cementless components. We have auxinium components, mobile bearing or fixed bearing implants, and medial pivot implants. But in order to understand where we are today, we have to look at where we were in the past. And I would argue that in 1985, uh, it was a very pivotal year for total joint replacement and total knee replacement in particular. 
1985, Ronald Reagan was our president. This was the fashion of the time. Mike Tyson was just beginning his boxing career. Whitney Houston just released her debut album. And Back to the Future was the must-see film of the time. In the world of orthopedics, there was a flurry in total joint replacement and total knee replacement in particular. The first volume of CORE, the editors opened the volume with a discussion about a knee replacement uh, symposium or course that was performed at West Virginia University in 1982. At that course, each authority on total knee replacement at that time presented their own version of what they think a total knee replacement should be done or how they think it should be done. And so the editors invited each of those authorities to submit an essay on their total knee replacement. And so the result was the first 112 pages of this volume were article after article about total knee arthroplasty, and each author provided their own argument for why they thought their way was best. So we'll focus on this article by Dr. Insall. So Dr. John Insall was the founding member of the Knee Society. He was the founder of the Insall Scott Key Institute for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. He was the author of the authoritative text on total knee replacement. He coined the idea of flexion and extension gaps. Most residents probably know him from the insult salvati ratio or the relationship between the patella and the patellar tendon. And he's also famous for the quadriceps snip um, procedure, which is a way of uh, providing additional exposure in total knee replacement. Dr. Insall was also a designer surgeon. He was involved in the development of the duocondylar and the duopatellar implants, which were modifications of the polycentric uh, implants from the 1970s. He also developed the total condylar prosthesis, which incorporated higher articular congruity between the femoral component and the tibial component, as well as introduced the domed patella button that we're so familiar with. The total condylar two, which incorporated this high tibial post, to stabilize the knee in deep flexion, which was then modified to the insult bursting PS1, which has a more modern tibial post. The IBPS2, which incorporates a metal backed tibia, which had significantly improved survivorship. Most residents from the VA will recognize the next gen legacy system, which incorporated left and right components, a raised lateral flange, and deepened trochlea to improve patellar tracking tibial offset stems, wedges, and augments for the full revision setting. The LPS Flex, which incorporated um, components to allow for hyperflexion and was designed for Middle Eastern and Asian populations where hyperflexion of the knee is more common in social and religious practices, as well as the mobile bearing knee, which incorporates a uh, mobile polyethylene component that is supposed to increase articular congruity. So not shown here are the many hinged and constrained prostheses that uh, Dr. Insall was also involved with. So in his article, his hallmark for total knee arthroplasty was incorporating mechanical alignment in combination with gap balancing. So what is mechanical alignment? Whenever we're first taught about this topic, we're typically shown this diagram, but my reaction to this has always been this. So let's break it down. If we look at a more simplified diagram here, we can isolate just the femur. If we define our vertical axis as a line perpendicular to the ground, we'll use green for that. We can contrast that with the mechanical axis in red, which is a line from the center of the femoral head, to the center of the trochlea. And then we can draw the anatomic axis, which is a line collinear with the shaft of the femur. And we know on average, the relationship between these two axes is about six degrees. If we look at the tibia, we can draw a vertical axis in green, our mechanical axis through the center of the tibial plateau to the center of the tibial plafond, and our anatomic axis, which is collinear to the center of the tibial shaft. And for all intents and purposes, the relationship between the anatomic and the mechanical axis is about zero degrees, they're collinear. Now I've exaggerated the position of the tibia in this slide to show that there's actually a three degree difference between the vertical axis and the mechanical axis of the tibia. Another important topic is the idea of the knee anatomic angle or the tibiofemoral angle. It's commonly said that the knee is in about six degrees of valgus. 
But when I think of Valgus, I usually think of this image from Hoppenfeld's diagram, or excuse me, from Hoppenfeld's book from the 1970s, which states that the distal segment is lateral to the midline relative to the proximal statement, which would be the definition of Valgus. But when I see a limb like this, I don't think that it's in valgus. But it's important to distinguish that the overall clinical appearance of the limb is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the bony anatomy within the soft tissues. So if we just extrapolate the femur and the tibia, this is the relationship that we're examining. So if we draw our mechanical axis through the limb, so through the center of the femoral head to the center of the tibial plafond in red, and then we draw our anatomic axis along the shaft of the femur, we know that the anatomic axis of the tibia is collinear with the mechanical axis, so I've not shown it here. But if we rotate this whole image and maintain the relationships, we can see now that the relationship between the femur and the tibia is more resembling of the image from Hoppenfeld's and does represent valgus. So let's look closer at the articular surface. We know that the distal femur has about three degrees of valgus relative to the mechanical axis and about nine degrees of valgus relative to the anatomic axis. For the proximal tibia, we know there's about three degrees of varus relative to the anatomic and mechanical axis. So if we apply this to total knee replacement, we begin with our extramedullary um, tibial cutting guide and we align it so that it's collinear to the mechanical axis of the tibia. This allows us to make a perpendicular proximal tibial cut. Then we insert an intramedullary uh, alignment guide within the distal femur. And we know that we're inserting it along the anatomic axis of the femur, as shown in blue. But if we want to make our bony cuts perpendicular to the mechanical axis, we know that we have to add about six degrees of valgus, which we can do with this dial in this system to dial in the amount of valgus that we need so we can make our bony cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis. Once we've done that, hopefully we've obtained a rectangular extension gap as shown here. Now we have the knee flexed and we identify our um, bony landmarks. So we draw a line along the transepicondylar axis, which is a line connecting the epicondyles of the distal femur. Then we draw a white sides line from the deepest portion of the trochlear groove to the center of the intercondylar notch. And then we visualize the posterior condylar axis or a line tangential to the posterior condyles. Now we know that the posterior condylar axis is about three degrees internally rotated relative to the transepicondylar axis. So if we use a posterior referencing cutting guide along the posterior condylar axis, we know that we have to compensate by externally rotating the uh, cutting guide three degrees so that it's in line with the transepicondylar axis. Now we can do that by inserting our drill with either in the three or the five hole in this system. Once we do that, we're able to perform our anterior, our posterior, and our chamfer cuts, and hopefully we obtain a rectangular flexion gap. Once we've performed our bony cuts, we evaluate the medial and lateral soft tissues and we can make a stepwise release of those structures to obtain a rectangular gap if we weren't able to do that with our bony cuts alone. Now, in contrast to Dr. Insull's mechanical alignment total knee arthroplasty, we can focus on this article by Dr. Hungerford, who promoted the anatomic alignment for total knee arthroplasty. And so you can see in this image, on the patient's right or our left, it's kind of hard to see from this old photo that there's a total knee replacement. On the, left, on the patient's left side or our right, there's a native knee. And Dr. Hungerford's anatomic alignment sought to recreate the relationship between the medial proximal tibial angle of the native knee for the positioning of the total knee replacement. So if we draw our angles there, they're about the same. If we contrast that with mechanical alignment, which would be perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the limb, we can see here in this diagram on the patient's right or our left that the components are both perpendicular to the mechanical axis through the limb, from the center of the femoral head through the center of the tibial plafond. If we look on the patient's left or our right, we can see that the femoral and tibial component are in about two to three degrees of varus in an attempt to recreate that joint line. Now, critics of anatomic alignment were concerned about the uh, possibility for increased uh, 
medial sided polywear from increased weight transmitted through that medial compartment, as well as component loosening and um, concerns for eventual uh, medial compartment overload and collapse. So this was actually looked at in a landmark study where they examined 3,152 total knee replacements. These were cemented non-modular metal back tibias. They looked at the tibial component alignment and they found that those tibial components that were in greater than three degrees of varus had a hazard ratio of 17.2 for failure. They contrasted that, excuse me, they um, further examined that and added on the BMI of 33.7 and noted 168 hazard ratio of failure. And they concluded that post-operative varus limb alignment was associated with higher failure rates. So if we look at this diagram, we see in image A, a preoperative radiograph showing a commonly varus knee. We see erosion of the medial compartment of the tibia as well as the medial femoral condyle. In image B, we can see a two-month post-operative radiograph, and we can see that the tibial component is in greater than three degrees of varus. And we can see that if we examine the axis of the, the keel here relative to the anatomic axis. If we look at image C, we can start to see osteolytic lucencies distal to the tibial component in the medial compartment. And then in D, a three months, excuse me, three years post-op, we can see collapse through the medial compartment into varus. That same group expanded their investigation using the same components. And instead of just looking at the tibial component alignment, they looked at the overall uh, limb alignment or the anatomic tibiofemoral angle. And they defined neutral as two and a half to 7.4 degrees of valgus. They also looked at tibial component alignment as they did in the previous study. But they also incorporated femoral component alignment and they defined femoral valgus as anything more than eight degrees of valgus. And so what did they find? For overall neutral alignment, they were able to attain that in 71% of knees, surprisingly. Uh, and it was associated with a 0.6% failure rate at a mean follow-up of 7.6 years. Contrasting with varus alignment, which had a 1.5% failure rate, and valgus alignment, which had a 1.4% failure rate. When they examined the tibial component alignment, they defined neutral as anything greater than 90 degrees and varus as anything less than 90 degrees. And so in this image here, you can see that this tibial component is in less than 90 degrees of uh, uh, varus. And so that was considered this varus uh, group. Anything that was greater than 90 was in this normal or valgus group. They were able to attain neutral in 82% of knees with a failure rate of 0.2%, whereas the varus knees had a failure rate of 3.8% or a hazard ratio of 10.6 for failure. For femoral component alignment, they defined neutral as anything less than 8 degrees of valgus. They were able to attain that in 92% of knees with a failure rate of 0.9% whereas those femoral components that were considered in valgus or in more than eight degrees of valgus had a failure rate of 3.6% or a hazard ratio of 5.1 for failure. So what does the uh, component alignment, uh, what are the implications of that on patient satisfaction? And so this is a very commonly cited study of 1,700 patients of total knee replacements performed in the province of Ontario, including cruciate retaining, posterior stabilized implants, as well as implants with and without patellar resurfacing. They used the Womack score as a patient reported outcome measure, and they followed up patients on one year. Surprisingly, what they found was only 81% of patients were satisfied after their primary total knee replacement. And so why was that? What were the risk factors for dissatisfaction? By and far, the most important risk factor was expectations were not met by the patient followed by a low one-year Womack score, high levels of preoperative pain at rest, and a complication requiring hospitalization. And so who were these dissatisfied patients? They were more likely to be of advanced age, to live alone, to be a reassessment rather than a new patient, to not have preoperative flexion less than 90 degrees, to have extreme pre-op pain, to have a low one-year Womack score. They were not willing to have surgery again, they usually had a postoperative complication and their expectations were not met. 
one of the theories as to why patients were so dissatisfied after the total knee is their, this idea of constitutional varus. And so in this study, they looked at 250 asymptomatic young adults aged 20 to 27, equal number of males to females, and they used the hip knee angle as a metric for their evaluation. And so they defined this as a mechanical axis between the femur, the femur and the tibia, which I've drawn here in red. And they, uh, they used this metric as a deviation from 180 degrees or straight up and down. Any negative values were considered varus, any positive values were considered valgus. And they considered neutral anywhere between negative three and positive three degrees. And so what they found was, interestingly, 32% of asymptomatic young males had a hip knee angle that was considered in varus. 17% of females also had a hip knee angle considered varus. 2% of males had knees that were considered in the valgus range, and 3% of females had knees considered in the valgus range. The contributing factors to constitutional varus, they argued, were the medial uh, proximal tibial angle, as shown here, the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, the knee valgus proximal angle, the medial neck shaft angle, the degree of femoral bowing, and interestingly, uh, those uh, volunteers who had uh, participated in increased impact sports during the second decade of life were also associated with constitutional varus. And they argued that it was related to the huter volkmann law, which states that uh, bony growth is inhibited by mechanical compression. And so if we see here, the thought was that there's increased mechanical compression within the medial compartment, which then inhibits the bony growth on that side, allowing the limb to grow into varus position, as shown here. That same group of investigators took their study one step further and looked at 780 patients, 248 uh, asymptomatic volunteers, and they contrasted that with uh, 532 patients with symptomatic varus arthritis. Within the symptomatic group, they had about half of them scheduled for high tibial osteotomies, and those were patients less than 55 years old, and the other half were scheduled for a total knee replacement. The metric that they used was the tibial joint line angle, which is a line uh, tangential to the tibial plateau relative to a line parallel to the floor and they used full length standing radiographs. Interestingly, they found that those uh, asymptomatic neutral patients had a joint line of about zero when standing, as did the asymptomatic varus uh, patients. However, the symptomatic arthritic varus patients had a joint line angle of about two degrees of varus, as shown here in this radiograph. So we have to ask ourselves, did INSOL get it wrong? Are there other reasons we should consider uh, doing alternatives to mechanical alignment? If patients have high levels of, of dissatisfaction and there's a high percentage of patients with constitutional varus, uh, Dr. Fitz will allude to uh, alternative methods of alignment have had comparable outcomes at 10 years. So should we consider doing something else other than mechanical alignment? And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Fitz. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chansky uh, for the invitation to speak today, as well as uh, Dr. Cohn for giving us an excellent overview of alignments. Um, my name is David Fitz. I'm one of the uh, total joint surgeons uh, here at the University of Washington, but the Northwest. And we're gonna continue on uh, to discuss alternatives to Dr. Insall's mechanical alignment. So we'll speak about uh, just a brief introduction, uh, then we will actually take a segue to talk about typewriters and innovation, and we'll talk about the rationale for kinematic alignment, the definition of kinematic alignment, surgical techniques for achieving this goal, outcomes, what we can do uh, going forward in total knee arthroplasty, and I'll provide some take home points for the residents and then wrap it up with time for questions. I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. Now, Dr. Cohen provided an excellent history of Dr. Insull's design, as well as the rationale for the mechanically aligned prosthesis. But to briefly recap, surgical treatment of knee arthritis has existed since at least the 1860s with arthrodesis in interposition arthroplasty. In fact, the first attempt at implant reconstruction was in the 1890s by Theophilus Gluck. His solution was to insert an ivory hinge prosthesis and fix it with plaster of Paris. 
Now this inevitably failed, but it was a revolution in thought and design of managing uh, devastating knee arthritis. It's not really until the 20th century that significant advancements were made. First in the 40s with hemiarthroplasties of either the tibia or the femur, and then in the 50s beginning with hinge prosthesis connecting the femur and the tibia. Now the 1970s were the turning point for total knees. Material science had advanced significantly, aided in part with Dr. Charnley and total hip replacements. Original polyethylene was developed in 1963, and our modern-day cement methyl methacrylate was approved by the FDA in 1971. At this time, various uh, designs arose independently, both here and abroad, and two schools of thought emerged. Do we strive to recreate the native anatomy of the knee, or do we create the most optimized mechanical solution? As you can see over here, these were some of the, the big names in Total Knee at the time. And it actually, it wasn't Dr. Insall, but it was Freeman and Swanson Designs that first advocated the kinematic, uh, excuse me, that advocated the mechanically aligned knee. This actually served the basis for the modern Total Knee. The goal of this implant was to emphasize the mechanical stability and prioritize function over preservation of anatomy. Freeman decided that mechanical alignment was best achieved by sacrificing the cruciate ligaments. He as well introduced the idea of creating the parallel cuts perpendicular to the mechanical axis. The dual condylar prosthesis that Dr. Kona talked about and was Dr. Insall's first design was in fact a native knee design which looked at preserving the cruciates. Now dissatisfied with the dual condylar prosthesis as early results from this implant indicated that the preservation of the cruciates impeded the correction of many of the deformities and the preservation of the tibial eminence prevented sturdy implantation of the tibial component, Insall reformulated his design along the ideas of Dr. Freeman, who in fact was actually his medical school classmate. So in 1974, we have the first total condylar knee. Now this was the first total knee that was reliable and reproducible, and it had long-term survivorship with very good functional outcomes. And included in this per first design were the many features of our current total knee designs. Cruciates were sacrificed, the symmetric femoral condyles, it had an anterior flange and a trough to help with patella tracking. Polyethylene was partially conforming and it had a lip to provide some A to P stability to prevent dislocation. And it also, while not seen in this picture, had a very short post to replace the tibial eminence and give some medial to lateral stability. Now there still was issues with A to P stability, especially in flexion with this design. So in the total condylar knee two, they attempted to address this and they added a central tibial post to address, to prevent the femur from anterior subluxating in flexion. This was our very first introduction of the posterior stabilized design. However, the increased uh, constraint that post arrived had a uh, higher loosening rates. So then, in 1978, Dr. Insall created the Insall Bernstein prosthesis that Dr. Cohn has already mentioned, and this was our first modern PS design. It included the central cam on the femur, which engaged the back of the tibia post at 70 degrees of flexion, and this drives the contact point posteriorly during flexion to create the rollback. And as Dr. Cohn had pointed out, he's, there have been multiple iterations of Dr. Insall's original uh, total condylar knee coming all the way up to our high flex designs and our next gen total prosthesis. And in most of all posterior stabilized designs, you can see remnants or you can see the traces of Dr. Insall's brilliant breakthrough in the 1970s. Now, as we asked, however, did Dr. Insall get it wrong? And if you have to leave now, at least you'll get the answer, and that answer is no. Dr. Insult did not get it wrong. His design and his solution worked, especially given the technical and material limitations of the time. As we've seen, that varus collapse was a very real thing, and if you put the femur in, excuse me, if you put the tibia in varus, you had a high likelihood of failure. However, as we've made advancements in material silence uh, in our understanding of knee kinematics, as Dr. Cohn showed, that potentially we can move beyond the neutral mechanical axis and have reasonable survivorship. So maybe the more important question we should answer is that fundamental question of joint reconstruction that they were grappling with in the 1970s. Should we strive for the best mechanical part, or should we be recreating the natural knee? Now, this debate never really has ceased, 
even with Dr. Insull's design, you just have to look at posterior stabilized versus cruise sheet retaining knees to see uh, the debate raging. However, the mechanically neutral total knee is the gold standard. And I would bet that nearly every person listening to this that has done a total knee or is trained to do a total knee was trained in part in the mechanically total knee. The question though is, maybe the best answer of the 1970s is no longer the best answer of the 2020s, even if it is the most ubiquitous answer. Ubiquity can be a very powerful force to overcome, especially when it's tied to education. Economists even have a term for this phenomenon, they call it lock-in. And it's actually the reason why a printer from Wisconsin in the 1860s dictates how you type the text on your phone. So with that, we're gonna segue briefly to talk about typewriters. Now for typewriters, the middle of the 19th century was much like total knees in the 1970s. The increasing pace of business communication had created a need for mechanization of the writing process. And from 1829 to 1870, like the total knee, many printing or typing machines were patented throughout Europe and America. The first commercially successful typewriter actually came out of Milwaukee in 1868, designed by Christopher Latham Scholes. He designed his first typewriter similar to a piano. And this first iteration used an almost alphabetic orientation of the keys in two rows, as you can see here. Unfortunately, the mechanistic design of the typewriter at the time created an issue. When individuals pressed adjoining keys in quick succession, the type bars would jam and the machine would stop. To mitigate this issue, Scholes then redesigned a keyboard to separate common sequences of letters, mm -hmm. looking at the bigram frequency of usage. So this looks at the most common letters used in the English language. And his design for this was to separate things such as the S and T and the E and R, as you can see here. Now, interestingly, Scholes' final patented keyboard is this one, and it's the one that we're all familiar with, and it's called the QWERTY keyboard. But if you notice, E and R are now directly next to each other. E and R is actually the fourth most common bigram, and R and E is the sixth most common bigram in the English language. So if Scholes was really trying to prevent this type R from jamming, his design would look like that first initial one with those letters separated. So while his mechanical problem influenced design, it's not the whole story. And what we need to look for is how did the QWERTY lock in? And that actually has to do with this idea of educational inertia and lock in. So Schultz did not have the resources to manufacture typewriters at a scale that he hoped that he could market to the world. So he partnered with E. Remingtons and Sons who were a rifle manufacturer at the time. Now Remington's genius was seeing typewriter distribution as an educational issue and not as simply a sales question. So what Remington did was they paired the release of their typewriter, the QWERTY design, with a touch typing course. They offered this free or discounted typewriters to a number of private businesses, colleges, and universities that would be teaching secretaries, stenographers throughout the world. The touch type course used the QWERTY keyboard so that the E and the R were actual home keys of the left hand. And, and this allowed typists to type without actually looking at the keyboard in the hunt and peck method. And they, so to speak, programmed the QWERTY keyboard into the minds of these stenographers that then went out, and the secretaries that went out throughout the, uh, the United States and the world. This was so successful that they gained market dominance in the 1880s, and they created a cabal of typewriters where everybody adopted this QWERTY design. And so it became the way to type and it became the design. Now, there are actually more deficient, excuse me, efficient designs for uh, keyboards. And one of those is called the Dvorak method. And this is actually designed by a psychologist and professor of education here at the University of Washington in 1932. And now in 1932, technology had advanced to such a degree that the jamming of the type bars was no longer an issue. So what Dvorak did was he grouped commonly used letters together that favored the person's dominant hand. He actually had left-handed and right-hand layouts. Multiple studies came out, one in particular in the 1940s by the US Navy, that showed the typists typed on the Dvorak method 
were in fact more efficient than those on the QWERTY method. But at this point, the ubiquity of the QWERTY method was too great. It has become commonplace in schools and businesses, and changing it just would have been too onerous um, for the, con the country. So if you look at your phone today, you'll notice you have the QWERTY method. But with a simple press of a button, you can change it to the Dvorak method or any other method that out there exists. However, we learn to type in one particular way and we don't have the pressure to change. 20% of our emails, texts, and documents don't fail because of our keyboard. So unfortunately, total needs is not the same issue. And so while Dr. Insall, like Schultz, had a very mechanical problem he had to solve, there still is a failure on our total needs to a reasonable degree, about 20% of dissatisfaction. And so perhaps we should find our Dvorak design of the total knee. One such an idea is the kinematic knee, which is a, a little slight modification of that anatomic knee that Dr. Cohn did. Now, the basis of this is that idea of constitutional varus, as well as the natural knee kinematics. So the axis of the leg is not truly straight. And the true extension flexion extension of our knee doesn't correspond with the transepicondylar axis. The typical alignment that we shoot for in a total knee as Dr. Cohn pointed out. These axes are significantly different in your coronal and sagittal locations. And it's actually the flexion extension axis is more posterior and internally rotated relative to the transepicondylar axis. So what this suggests is that not only is our knee not straight, in the coronal plane with people being in kinematic varus is that our knee doesn't actually even flexion, flex and extend along the same axis that we're placing total knees in. So the goal of a kinematic alignment is then to align the total knee along the individual's normal axes. And this was first developed by Dr. Stephen Howell at the University of California, Davis. And the idea of a kinematically aligned total knee is to recreate the individual anatomy of the patient's knee and have it move along the natural axes of rotation of the knee. It is in essence a knee surfacing. So the femur and tibial components are placed in a more anatomic position, minimizing the need for ligament releases in any compensatory rotational changes in the femur and the tibia. This preserves the soft tissue envelope and provides a more natural functioning knee. Now the basis of this is the three kinematic axis of the knee. Three axes govern the movement of the patella and the tibia with respect to the femur. Understanding these interrelationships is key to the kinematic alignment. The first axis we need to speak about is the transverse axis, the femur, about which the tibia flexes and extends. This passes through a center of a circle fit to the articular surface of the femoral condyles, where they flex from 10 to 160 degrees. This is noted in the green on the diagram to the right. The second transverse axis we need to talk about is the flexion axis of the patella. Now this is anterior and dis, excuse me, proximal to the flexion axis of the tibia, but it is parallel, noted in purple on the diagram. The last axis is the longitudinal axis about which the tibia internally and externally rotates on the femur. This is noted in orange on the diagram. And this is perpendicular to the two transverse axes of the femur. So in a kinematically aligned knee, we place the component in parallel to these axes and perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. However, the one thing to note is that while these axes are aligned parallel or perpendicular to one another, none are aligned orthogonally to our three anatomic planes, which, we can't which means we can't find them on sagittal, coronal, and axial imaging. Now, this is somewhat confusing, so what I'm going to do is provide a... Uh, a video that will provide some clearance to this. This is out of a, a paper from the Orthopedic Research Laboratories of Cleveland, Ohio, um, from their paper presented in 2007, uh, AOS. The classic mechanical alignment and the more recently performed kinematic alignment. Mechanical alignment on the left places the components perpendicular to the vertical mechanical axis while kinematic alignment on the right places the components parallel to the transverse flexion extension axis which follows the inclination of the natural joint line in the APVU. 
These two approaches result in different boner sections, placing the TKA components in two different orientations, mechanically aligned in blue, kinematically aligned in orange. Two different NISA models were created, one for each case. Different reference axes are used in mechanical versus kinematic alignment. A vertical midplane axis perpendicular to the floor is moved to coincide with the geometric center of the ankle joint. The mechanical axis is typically three degrees from the vertical axis. The mechanical axis is difficult to directly visualize in the surgical theater. However, there are many methods of indirectly determining its location. One of these, the transepicondylar axis, determines the placement of saw guides that create boner section planes that are perpendicular to the mechanical axis. Kinematic alignment seeks to restore the joint line to the individual patient's pre-diseased state, referencing the flexion extension axis. This imaginary line passes through the geometric centers of each posterior femoral condyle. Equal resection, allowing for cartilage wear and saw curve of the distal femur and posterior condyles, ensures that the resection surfaces are parallel to the flexion extension axis. When the thickness of the implanted femoral component matches the resected bone fragments, the patient's estimated healthy cartilaginous surface anatomy would be restored. The proximal tibial slope is resected to restore the individual patient's original varus and posterior slope. The axial rotation of the tibial component aims to closely match the axial rotation of the femoral component. The kinematic alignment flexion extension reference axis and bone resection planes in orange may be compared to those of the classic mechanic alignment surgical procedure in blue. AP views and axial views are provided for clarity. On average, the kinematically aligned femoral component is six degrees more flexed, three degrees more valgus, and four degrees more internally rotated than the mechanically aligned femoral component. So the question is, how do we achieve this alignment, especially if everybody's knee is different? Hal began first performing this in 2006, in which he relied on patient-specific cutting guides. He achieved this by obtaining a preoperative MRI or a CT arthrogram on a patient. The articular surface of the arthritic knee was then modeled into a knee with a normal articular surface by filling in the articular defects and removing the osteophytes. An algorithm then shaped this best fitting 3D model of the femoral of a femoral component to the articular surface of the normal knee that was created. Software then set the AP axis of the tibial component perpendicular to the flexion extension axis of the femoral component, kinematically aligning the two components. The tibia was then centered, the tibial component, excuse me, was then centered beneath the tibia to best fit the size of the plateaus. Custom guides were then created based on the normal knee to fit the actual arthritic knee of the patient, and then cuts were made through these. Now, this was costly because MRI was needed for everybody, as well as uh, some individuals couldn't get it because of cardiac issues, such as pacemakers. So to eliminate the expense of patient-specific instrumentation and those unable to obtain MRIs, HAL developed a new technique that used generic conventional instrumentation to kinematically align the knee. However, the fundamental goal remained the same, and was to orientate the total knee about those three normal axes of the knee. To achieve this without 3D customization, however, certain assumptions regarding arthritic knees were needed to be made so that you could, in, an, in essence, design or assume a 3D model of a non-arthritic knee for every patient. These are based on Hal's own work, as well as other studies looking at anthropometric studies of uh, knees in MRI. Now, eight kinematic assumptions base his caliper technique. The most important of which is that the radii of the median lateral femoral condyles are the same in varus and valgus knees. 88% of femoral condyles have cartilage wear, but without any bone wear. And additionally, we all learned that we have to be concerned about a hypoplastic femoral condyle in a valgus knee. From Hal's work, they noted that there was no hypoplasia in femoral condyles on either varus or valgus knees, so there was no correction needed for this. And typically, cartilage is about two millimeters in thickness on a native knee. So for a varus knee, you typically have wear 
distally but nowhere posteriorly. So you don't need to adjust your posterior cuts to assess for only bony wear. In a valgus knee, wear is typical distal, but occasionally posteriorly. So in a valgus knee, you need to be aware that you may have to adjust your distal femoral cuts. And then lastly, calipered measure of thickness for each distal and posterior cut should equal the amount of resection. So what that means is that what you're placing on, the size of the implant, should equal the cartilage that's been lost, the bone that you cut, and the kerf of the saw blade. So to do this, you can use conventional invert instrumentation to perform what's called the caliper kinematic alignment. The first thing you do is you make a measurement of the AP distance from the tibia to the distal medial femoral condyle with the knee 90 degree of flexion. This measurement will then be recreated for your flexion space at the end when you have the prosthesis on. So this is marked. Next, the level of resection is set, so the combined thickness of the distal femoral resection equals the wear of the, the wear from the arthritis as well as the kerf of the saw blade. You make your cuts and then you verify the measurements, and these are added to a uh, checklist to make sure that everything is going to be equal. Following the cuts, you then position the posterior referencing guide to zero. You don't assess for three degrees difference between posterior condyles and the transverse epicondyl axis because you're not shooting for that. Excuse me. Then you affix your four in one cutting gob and you make your posterior cuts, measuring uh, those as well to ensure that you've taken off the appropriate amount of bone. Again, assessing for bony wear, cartilage wear, and so, uh, the curve of the saw blade. The attention is then turned to the fem excuse me, to the tibia. The PCL is preserved. And first, you outline a nearly elliptical border of the lateral tibial plateau. Bisecting the long axis of this sets your tibial rotation. So two parallel drill holes are made along that axis, as you can see here. And then that is the alignment that you'll use for setting the rotation of your tibial component. Varus valgus orientation of the tibia is then resected parallel to the articular surface, assessing for either bone or cartilage loss that's already been had. You also match the slope of the native patient and you make your tibial cut. You then verify again with calipers to make sure that the, after dealing with cartilage wear and bone loss, that these are equal. As you can see here, this is the native uh, lot, excuse me, the, the native, uh, varus valgus orientation of the tibia. And then this is how you align your tibial component with that boundary elliptical border that you've already drawn. Lastly, if you're planning to resurface the patella, you do that in the standard way of removing the same amount of patella bone that you're gonna put for your button. So once you've made all your cuts, there's no ligament release or anything that needs to be done. The flexion extension gaps are checked, and if corrections are needed, then a stepwise algorithm is done to achieve kinematic alignment. And the underlying principle is that corrections are made through the bone of the tibia. No more cuts on the femur and no ligament release. And this is done by fine tuning the varus valgus cut with recuts or the proximal distal positions of the tibia resection or the slope. This is a stepwise uh, guide here. Um, the idea, however, is that if you're tight in extension, you need to first remove your osteophytes and then recut your tibias one way or the other, depending on whether you're loose medial or loose lateral. So ultimately, this is the difference in a kinematically aligned knee and a mechanically aligned knee. We have our mechanical here on the left and our kinematic here on the right. In particular, the femoral component is two degrees, two to four degrees more valgus and the tibial component is two to four, deg two to four degrees more varus. Now for all of us that were trained to a mechanically aligned knee, these x-rays on the right look terrible. They look like you've cut it into varus. This is a sloppy total knee. And the point that needs to be made is that while it looks like we're outside that safe zone of neutral mechanical alignment, this is actually the goal. Now the big question is, does this work? Now if we look at Hal's own data, he looked at 214 of these knees. He used first PSI instrumentation and he had follow-up for about 38 months. This was published in CORE in 2013. 
And again, you can see that his results show similar positioning of his components. And he actually had excellent outcome scores with his mean Oxford knee score 43 with the best being 48 and a Womack score of 92. And they were similar between alignment categories. And what this was is that he looked at neutral mechanical alignment, varus outliers and valgus outliers. He didn't find any significant difference between these historical mechanical alignment categories in his new kinematically aligned knee. He had zero catastrophic failures and he had three revisions, none of which were for tibial component failures. He then returned to his outcome back 10 years. He looked at 207 knees, had survived that initial uh, cohort, again with the PSI instrumentation. And he had almost a 98% all cause survivorship and 98.4% aseptic survivorship. And again, excellent satisfaction scores at 10 years. Now, he did have five patients who revision surgery was undertaken, which accounted for about 2.5% of his cohort. One, he had two post-operative infections, and then they had one tibial component loosening. And at 10 years, this actual tibial component loosening was posterior and related to slope rather than in the varus valgus angle. They did, however, have four patellar complications requiring revision. And that is a concern that we'll address later is that the rotation tends to be different and is this, does this affect patella tracking? Now, this is the design surgeon and this is a case series at best. So we should look at if there's any higher level of evidence. And there's actually five level one randomized control trials that looked at kinematic alignment compared to mechanical alignment. I'll briefly summarize them here. So the first one is 2014 randomized control trial from a Phoenix VA. Looked at 88 patients, 44 were randomized to patient specific kinematic alignment, 44 had conventional mechanical alignment. They had two year follow up. You can note the alignment there again within the expectation of more valgus in your femur, more tibia in your, excuse me, more varus in your tibia. And at minimum of two years, all, all outcome scores were better for the kinematic aligned group. So suggests that at early time points, kinematically in that line, these may be doing better. The next paper comes from the UK. And it was again, randomized control between PSI, kinematic alignment, and conventional mechanical alignment. Again, alignment was similar to what we'd expect with a kinematically aligned knee. And again, there were, in this case, there are no statistically significant differences in any outcome measurements between the groups at one year. So a 2007 study from, 17 study from Germany, again, looked at PSI kinematic alignment compared to conventional alignment. They had only one year follow-up and again, had similar mechanical, uh, excuse me, similar alignment targets on their kinematically aligned knees, both in the femur and the tibia. What they noted was that significant difference in scores that favored kinematic alignment at one year. However, if you look in the bottom graph, that kinematic alignment had more outliers with poorer outcomes compared to mechanical alignment. So it begs the question that perhaps there isn't a much wiggle room as we talk about mechanical alignment having a zero degree plus or minus two plus or minus three degrees. Whereas if you miss the mark in kinematic alignment, do these patients do worse than if you miss the mark with mechanical alignment? Now there was an interesting study out of Australia, it was a 2009 study that actually did bilateral total knees on individuals. This is a hybrid total knee with a press fit tibia and a cemented femur. And they looked at navigated kinematic alignment compared to navigated mechanical alignment. And again, alignment of kinematic was similar to what you'd expect with the tibial and femoral components. There were no significant differences with respect to their flexion or their functional scores as noted in table two. Interestingly, if patients did favor a knee, they preferred their kinematic alignment. However, over half of the patients in this had no preference between the knees. The last study is a uh, randomized control trial from New Zealand, and it's been published at two-year data as well as this year, the five-year data. It looked at 99 primary total knees, randomized to either PSI, kinematic alignment, or conventional mechanical alignment. Now, at the five-year data, they only had 95 uh, survivorship. And at their five-year data, they didn't show any significant differences in any functional scores between a kinematic alignment or mechanical alignment. 
there were more reoperations by one in kinematic alignment compared to mechanical alignment. But however, there were no revisions into kinematic alignment for femoral tibial failures. In the mechanical alignment, there was one failure that revived, needed revision of all components. So it's, all of this suggests that at the very least, kinematic alignment is not inferior to mechanical alignment. However, questions remain. We only have a 10-year study from the design surgeon, and it's truly just a case series. And then we have Young's randomized control trial of five years. So we don't have any true midterm data or any long-term data to success the survivorship of this. The additional concerns persist too. So while we have improved our materials and our methods since Dr. Insall, shear remains a suboptimal force for cement. And so the suggestion, the thought remains that if we're putting these tibias in a lot of theirs, on average three degrees, but can increase, are these gonna have failures? So Howell's group actually published on this, and he looked at all of his kinematically aligned knees that we performed since 2006, which is around a cohort of 3,000. And he noted an only an incidence of 0.3% of tibial failure. And he remarked that in all his tibial failures, it was more posterior subsidence and posterior edge wear rather than varus subsidence. So his technique criticism is that you need to match the native slope of the tibia. The next issue is patella, which I briefly talked about. In kinematic alignment, the femoral component tends to be internally rotated, and this could set up concern for patella tracking. Hal's group again looked at all of his total knees done kinematically, and they reported an incidence of only 0.4% of patellar instability. And again, this wasn't due to internal rotation they felt, but it was more to a flex component of the femur. And then if you match, the, if you don't flex the femur, if you put it in neutral aligned to the anterior border, you have better patella tracking. Next, the question is, kinematic alignment recreates a pathologic limb as these patients have already proven to develop arthritis. Should we try to recreate something that has failed already? Especially as we're putting total knees in younger individuals that wore out their knees earlier and are gonna have longer lifespans. Unfortunately, we just don't have the data to support how long these are gonna last and do they do better than mechanical alignment. And then lastly, there are some technical considerations. All of the studies that I presented that are level one are due to patient-specific instrumentation or navigation. Is caliper kinematic alignment, kinematic alignment is good? How the designer has good results, but what about the typical community surgeon? And as I mentioned, is there any room for error in kinematic alignment? When we look at mechanical alignment, we know that we have a little bit of wiggle room, one degree or two degrees, one way or the other. But this, the same may not be said for kinematic alignment. So where do we go from now? It's been nearly 50 years since Dr. Insall first designed the total condylar knee. And as Dr. Cohn pointed out, large registry studies show that we still aren't hitting the mark on about one in five patients. We are scoring a B, B minus in total knees if we look at it that way. And we would not have accepted that in college, so why should we accept it now? Now, kinematic alignment is an answer. It may not be the answer, but it does appear promising. However, there are other quote unquote keyboards out there if we're trying to get away from our mechanically aligned QWERTY keyboard. We have prosthesis that introduce varus into them, such as the Journey 2 from Smith and Nephew. We're looking into conformist knees or the custom implants, the bespoke knee for an individual setting them to their natural alignment based on minimal bony resection. There's the medial pivot design that desi that's designed to recreate the normal kinematics of the knee. There's even individuals that advocate going back to the bicruciate retainings, similar to the duocondylar prosthesis of Dr. Insall in the 70s. We have robotics now that are technically supposed to put us in a more precise alignment. However, the question remains, what should that alignment be? And then we also have technology advancing at a remarkable rate. We have 3D printing. We also have cheapening gait analysis and software that maybe allow us to have a personalized knee based on how you walk and how your knee is designed. The truly bespoke knee that conformers can't quite make. So what we need to do is we need further long-term studies. We need to follow up and see if we have late-term results that can rival Dr. Insall's mechanical aligned knee. We need further high quality research into caliper kinematic alignment. And then the last thing is potentially we 
need to update our knee scoring systems and our patient reported outcomes. It might be that our current systems are too blunt to detect a difference between these technological advancements and what we were doing in the 70s. We've advanced technology to the same rate, but have we advanced our measurements to the same level? Now for the residents, I'd like to just kind of hit home three things. Kinematic alignment is not a sloppy total knee. It's not putting the component in a little bit of varus. It's a separate arthroplasty philosophy with, you, with unique alignment goals. And those goals are the three axes of a kinematically aligned knee about which a kinematic, excuse me, a natural knee kind of flexes and extends. So you have the flexing axis of the tibia, which is a line drawn between uh, cylinders or circles best fit on your femoral condyles. You have your flexion axis of your patella, which is parallel to this flexion axis of your tibia. And then you have your rotational axis of your tibia. And so a kinematically aligned knee puts a component orientated perpendicular and parallel to these alignments. And then lastly, kinematic alignment is at least non inferior to the mechanical alignment at early and with house data and midterm mid -time, mid time points. So these are my references. There's a lot of information there, but is there any, we have some time for questions, I hope, and I hope I can answer. Why, why don't um, people use that raised hand sign if they have questions and we can go through them in an organized fashion? Um, I know people have to get to work, uh, but we don't have to worry about packing this morning. So we can, we can, keep going if Dr. Fitz and Dr. Cohn can stay with us. And thank you. That was a really uh, great summary of a, of a difficult, uh, ch uh, challenging topic to present. I, I would ask one question, uh, Dr. Fitz, a couple of questions, but um, can you send out the link to that video so we can watch it with the sound? Of course. I, uh, I think what potentially may have happened was that uh, so that I could hear and talk to maximize um, my headphones may have prevented everybody from hearing it, but I will get that, uh, that link out to Aaron so that everybody can get it. Um, I see Dr. Manor is still on the list. Um, Paul, do, do you, you are using the conformist for the majority of your knees. Do you have any, any comments on this topic? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely am seeing, uh, a number of things that look promising. Um, Patients do seem to recover faster. Patients seem to be using less medication. And, you know, the satisfaction for what that's worth um, it seems to be better for the conformist group than for my, my persona group. Um, what I see with this kinematic light with the, uh, with the conformist is that it, it just seems to behave more like a normal knee in the sense that uh, the, the behavior of the of the implant as I'm putting it in just seems to be more like it like a like a real knee as opposed to to an artificial knee. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that is. Um, I think there is some element here of, of kinematics. Um, you know, part of the issue is that. I think you know. I think initially the uh, kinematic alignment or you know, Hungerford's idea got a bad rap because he was using what turned out to be one of the worst implants out there, which was the PCA knee. And the problem with the PCA knee was that the polyethylene was bad, the polyethylene was thin. And as a consequence, the failure rate may not necessarily have been related to Hungerford's idea. The other problem is that unless you're doing this extremely uh, precisely, um, you get into the trouble of a three degree varus knee is probably not a bad thing. A, a six degree varus knee is, is probably a terrible thing, but the human eye can all, cannot distinguish less than a three degree angle. And so unless you're doing this with some sort of navigation, either in the construction of the implant or in, as you're doing the actual surgery with a computer or some sort of navigation system, your eye is probably not good enough to detect that three degree difference. And as a consequence, you know, you can talk about this being, you know, you know, the center rotations here, it's two millimeters back from here, it's four millimeters up from here, but it's unlikely that you as a surgeon are going to be able to figure that out. Um, 
you know, that being said, I mean, I, I trained as an insole, you know, I, I, I trained with a, somebody who had been an insole fellow. Uh, so the first 10 years of my career, I did everything by the, by the insult book. Um, what you see in un- insults book is pretty much what I did. You know, I still do it to a certain extent, but I, th- I think I've definitely moved away from that a little bit over time. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Fitz and Dr. Cohn. Um, so one of the, a couple of questions I wanted to ask you um, were classically taught from the literature that the most common complications in knee replacements uh, perhaps outside of the dissatisfaction that we see in maybe 15% of our patients is related to the patella. Um, I still see patients that that their only complaint after a really nice looking um, knee replacement mm-hmm. um, is related to that uh, lateral aspect, the lateral facet, the lateral patellofemoral joint. Um, and so do you think there are any consequences with that uh, slight internal rotation, relative internal rotation of the femoral component? And do you think, my second question is, um, do, you, do you, Dr. Howell, I think, minimizes posterior collapse of that tibial component? Um, if I had my knee replaced and saw some of the x-rays that you were showing, I would be a little bit concerned. Uh, about the long-term survivability of my tibial component. Um, do you think you can separate that posterior medial subsidence from medial subsidence and say that it's not related to that varus alignment that you aim for with a, a kinematically aligned knee? So to address the, the first question, I too, Dr. Chansky, have a concern about patella tracking. Um, one of my reasonings of doing this in addition to this being Dr. Cohn's, uh, what he suggested is that I had been toying with the idea of doing a kinematically aligned knee, but my concern is that if you internally rotate the femoral component, people are gonna hate their, and their knee starts dislocating, their patella starts dislocating, that's a major issue. Um, Hal's group argues in the paper that I briefly mentioned that the kinematically aligned knee actually restores the more native Q angle to an individual rather than the mechanically aligned knee. But I would be concerned that as you're doing that, you're not having the same tracking um, and that would lead to an issue. Now, the, the, to answer the second question, um, one of the, the ways to, to potentially get around the patella would be to not resurface it, um, but that opens up a whole can of worms as well. Um, about persistent pain and further uh, surgeries needed. The other uh, questions you answered is posterior medial wear or subsidence different than actual uh, varus subsidence. And his data suggests, it it seems pretty promising, but I agree with you that looking at those x-rays, I would be very concerned about failure rates, uh, especially if you're doing these in younger individuals um, earlier on and who are going to be higher active on this. And so I, I'm not sure that this is the answer, uh, especially it may not be the answer with a conventional prosthesis is that Dr. Manners pointed out that the conformis knee is a typical prosthesis, but it's designed uniquely for an individual. And it might be that you shoot for mechanical alignment at your bone cement interface, and then you look for mechanical alignment at the joint interface. Is that maybe we should be redesigning prosthesis to maximize the mechanical support of the cement in the bone, and then getting the kinematic benefits of the knee itself? I don't know. I, I don't see any hint, so I'm going to ask you another question, and then I'll open it up to again Dr. Cohn, Dr. Fitz, um, Dr. Manner. Um, do you think? I'm just thinking about tip, the typical veteran that we do a total knee on, even, my, even in my practice at the U, you know, they're often in, sev- in severe varus. Um, they do have posterior wear on their medial femoral condyle, not just distal. They'll have an uncorrectable, um, you know, six, seven degree varus deformity or sometimes more. Um, do you still think kinematic uh, is the way to go for those patients? Well, you haven't, I, I want to be fair, you haven't advocated really for kinematic. I think you've made a very well-balanced um, approach. So I wouldn't say is it the way to go, but 
Um, would you favor mechanical alignment technique for those patients? So I, you, that's the exact patient that I'd be concerned about, especially also maybe a, a valgus flexion contracture as well. Um, How's data in what he's presented in individuals that have even significant extraarticular deformity and windswept deformities suggest that you can get by with it and that they do very well. I think that that you need a leap of faith. And he, as the design surgeon, he might know the techniques and have the technical uh, capabilities to do that. Uh, the question is, is that do we all? And that's why I, if you look at the data, his data seems significantly great, whereas the randomized control trials tend to be more of a uh, non-inferior. If you actually look at some of those studies, they actually exclude those patients that you were talking about um, and say that significant massive deformities are not capable for kinematic alignment, whereas how is the only one that will do it in anyone? Um, I would be concerned uh, for all those reasons that we've talked about, the varus collapse, patella tracking, um, in that maybe 80% is pretty good on somebody whose knee is so destroyed. And so what I mean by that is getting a good outcome on a mechanically aligned knee that's gonna last, maybe better than looking for that home run uh, on these individuals that have such severe deformity that nothing's gonna work great for them. And there's, thank you, there's still no hint, so I'll ask you one more question. Um, as a relatively recently trained total joint surgeon, um, how did the surgeons approach this at Mass General? So um, we, had a, we had one, so everybody went for the mechanical alignment. We had people that were insol advocates, um, but I can say that over in Boston, everybody keeps the cruciate. So that's, uh, that's the little difference is that everybody tries to balance the cruciate. I did have one attending who wanted to dabble in mechanic, excuse me, kinematic alignment, but to bring up Dr. Manner's point, he didn't feel that his eye and his technical capabilities were able to do that with conventional instrumentation. So before he would do that, he, knew he wanted some sort of adjunct, whether it be a robot or navigation, and didn't quite feel that the workflow uh, changes that that needed to institute would benefit significantly his patients from a kinematical alignment standpoint. We also did use the journey to prosthesis, which builds in a little bit of varus into the prosthesis. So it's somewhat of one of those hybrid. Right, right. But nobody was a kinematic aligned advocate from the doing everything with calipers or cutting into varus or doing any of those techniques that I talked about. Okay. Alrighty, well, thank you very much, Dr. Cohn and Dr. Fitz. That was uh, really an excellent summary of a, of a challenging topic. Um, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Really nice job. Thanks. Yeah.